Welcome back to Just Giants with Grump and the Cranky Fan, the best damn podcast for the best damn football team. I am your host, the Football Grump. With me, as always, is the Mike, the Cranky Fan, and we are two and zero, oh, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time since this podcast has ever existed. The last time the Giants were two and zero oh, was the year before this podcast was born. <laughs> Which might make us the mush. We, we don't know. Uh, how you doing, Grump? Um, I was thinking about it this afternoon. What was the last relevant game you and I have attended that we've actually won? Uh, I think you and I – Well, so like there's technically relevant, right? I mean um, like last year that uh, – Weren't the Giants technically still relevant that week that they fired Jason Garrett and Daniel Jones? Uh, that's what I mean. Nah, like, the, they're kind so of, the, I mean, the, the last one the, that we – yeah, okay. Then then 2016, right? Because 2017 was over before it even started. Well, I was uh, going to say that that Buck game we went to in Tampa, the Daniel Jones first oh. start. We're, I mean, yeah. re- re- meaning relevant, like, you know, if you're 0-2, you're, w- that you're on the – but that You're game, we were we were zero and two when we showed up. Yeah, I mean that's kind of like you're on the precipice of being irrelevant. You're zero and three. You are relevant the rest of the way. So yeah, no, um, I get it. It just yeah. There's that game, yeah. and then I guess before that would be 2016, which was the Dallas game, that last game of the year. <laughs> That's a long time ago. <laughs> that's yeah. a long, long, long time ago. So it was great. You know, we can have a lot of fun with the fact we are 2-0. and The season ended today. We would be – probably have a bye going into the playoffs uh, and all that type of stuff. But the fact is that for the first time in a long, long time, we didn't go to a giant game where the game was the afterthought after a tailgate or going to the Jameson room and having a crowd very excited. I mean you could feel it in that place that it was – you know, they're ready. This fan base is ready to – you know, enjoy giant football again and go to games that are important and enjoy winning. And we don't have to worry about after every win, you know, what's our draft pick going to be or rebuilds or any of that nonsense. We, that was joy walking out of that stadium yesterday. People were chanting. It was, it was like the old days, like in the old stadium. It was was great. Coming off. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was wonderful. (laughs) It was a really good time. I had a lot of fun. Um, you you had a bit of a scramble to get there, but you made it. Ugh, you you yeah, missed absolutely no part of that game. Yeah, I was um, on Saturday. I went to the Cal Notre Dame game in South Bend, and I, you know, all the planning in the world doesn't make up for when you have a broken plane. So it was, I don't know, nine o'clock, and I was still in Detroit when they got on another plane, and you know, it all worked out getting to Newark and the trains and everything, and. Uh, I walked in right after the right after the opening kickoff. I missed the one play, and it was one of the highlights of the game. So, and no, it sucks. I got to miss the tailgate. I'll catch you guys for the Monday night game, but uh, didn't miss anything. And um, I've been really, really angry if I missed it, and really, 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 really angry if I missed it and we won. So, it all works out. So, okay, so you had that much fun at this. This was a. Uh, this was. I did. Yeah, this I is great. We don't usually win in good weather or bad weather. Yeah, and you know, again, I've been taking a very cautious approach. I've been taking the, you know, I know I've been I've been debating with people today on Twitter, you know, about, you know, would you rather have the draft pick or win games? And you know, I'm a very I'm, I'm, I know this is a rebuild, but I'll worry about that once we are irrelevant. But we're not yet, and. I really had a good time Sunday. It was again. It felt like the old days. It felt like, you know, you know, this team is playing, and we're going to give our stars and farts. And you know, they're they're playing for this coaching staff right now. They're they're buying in, and that might last for four weeks. It might last for six years. We don't know, but for right now, they are. And you know, I don't know about you, but my I was just like, what's happening in the Dallas game? And you know, oh, I got to watch this Philly game tonight. You know, we're what we're recording this. They're up 24-7, you know, late fourth quarter. But those are things we didn't really care about that much the last couple of years because we were irrelevant and we sucked. You know, again, this might be a September thing, but I'm embracing it fully. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we don't 
pay money to get good seats to see uh, our draft pick next year. I mean, we go exactly. be entertained and see a great game, and we saw a great game. And you're right. Uh, you know, whatever was happening was really like I would watch the Philly game to make sure that they lost, just so I could talk shit. It was like really the only relevance the rest of the NFL had the last few years was just exactly like, yeah just pure curiosity and now it's like competitive and active part of everything and Mm -hmm. man this is it's a sad conversation to have so i'm just uh we're we're gonna keep gloating as long as we're winning and uh we're two and oh kings of new york and um yeah it was a great win and i'm happy for it um it was it was the first time in how many years 14 years with the jets giants yankees and mets all won on the same day yeah, I don't. Pretty amazing. Like pretty amazing stat. It is. Um, <clears throat> so let's uh, let's kind of go through this game just a little bit here. Giants won nineteen sixteen. Not really the prettiest win at all. Uh, actually, bit of a slugfest. But that doesn't mean that it wasn't enjoyable. Um, if you're a loser and you only care about high scoring affairs, then it was probably boring as hell. Uh, but there was a lot of really <laughs> cool stuff going on there and. I want to start with special teams. Uh, the opening kickoff, you know, everything, it, to me, that was huge. That really was the tone of this game, was that this was going to be an ugly game. Um, but the Giants were going to capitalize on the ugliness, I guess. was really really was a good thesis for the entire game. Uh, opening kickoff, Dane Belton recovers a fumble. I mean, how great is that? It, dude's first snap in the NFL, too. <laughs> um, it's like hitting a home run on your first pitch as a major leaguer. It's yeah, for real. Um, you know what? And the special teams were a big bugaboo last week. The whole preseason, we were kind of bitching mm-hmm. about it in that preseason doesn't matter kind of way. Uh, but then there was the missed extra point last week because of a bad snap. So then it became real serious, and uh, they 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 saved this game. I mean, the fumble in the opening kickoff. They had a big punt. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, they nearly had a blocked punt at one point, and right. Graham Ganove was four for four. Two of them passed 50 yards in the most crucial moments, 52 and 56 yards. Special teams showed up in a huge way this week. Yeah, I don't give stars to, to Seminoles ever, but he, he had a good game. I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> all right. So um, that's all the special teams talk I really want to have. I want to – I want to kind of focus on the coaching a little bit here. Uh, there was nothing really egregious in this game, coaching-wise. There were no challenges. Uh, you know, he didn't challenge anything that was stupid. Uh, There's no challenges at all. Um, you know, timeouts, time management, all was was good in this game. So nothing there. But I do want to focus on something else, and that is, can we talk a little bit about Kenny Galladay and Kadarius Tony? Oh, I have mm-hmm. notes. All right, all so my look, notes. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not even going to say anything. We haven't spoken about this. I'm going to just give you the floor. Is that cool? Yes. All right. I am. It. I'm giving this coaching staff a star. Uh, you know, again, the team is buying in. Like I said, you know, they're playing for him. They're, they're, you know, they, they think they got a shot for the playoffs. That's all great. But to me, and I'm going to go back to this theme I've been saying for weeks and weeks and weeks about this team that this new coaching staff. And this new front office is all about starting over and creating culture. And if you are part of the old regime, if you are part of the the way things used to be, part of the losing mentality and the quitting mentality that this team has, there's no part place for you on this team anymore. And the way they are handling Kenny Galladay to me, especially in a year where we, you know, it's great we're two and zero, we're all excited about the playoffs, but let's be let's be Let's be honest, this is not a playoff team. We don't think. I mean, there may be some crazy things happen, but it's not like Kenny Galladay has to be on the field or we're blowing a playoff spot. So it doesn't matter what his salary is. They are setting the culture here that you have to perform. You can't just because you have a big contract, just because of what your name is, just because of any other factor, you are assured, you know, a place on the starting 11 and being on the field. I mean, he had two snaps yesterday. I mean, look at the, the breakdown of all the other receivers. Kenny Sills, 67 snaps. Sterling Shepard, 64. 
And again, Sterling Shepard's a guy that was coming back from surgery. It's not like he was he knows this new playbook by heart, but no, he's on the field. Uh, James, 31 snaps. Rookie. Uh, um, Kadarius Toney, who we talked about, you know, last week, why is he on the field? 28 snaps. Even Darius Slayton, a, a guy who's been called up from the practice squad, four snaps. So these guys are playing ahead of a guy that, you know, is making a ton of money and, you know, We've seen it. We, we, there's all these things we try to dismiss. You know, where was he last year? Uh, you know, where is he in preseason? You know, you know the, the, the attitude it appears that he has, all these different things. And this coaching staff's like, screw it. You know, this is the way we're doing things right now. And it doesn't matter what was, was past is past. Um, the one thing, I, the question I do have for you, Grump, is, you know, everybody keeps saying, well, you can't cut him because it's dead cap money for this year. And this, this is a question I honestly have. What is the impact of dead cap money in 22 on 23? Uh, um, n- nothing. So to me, it's a sunk cost. So I don't understand why everybody is so freaked out about, well, it'll be a huge dead cap hit in 2022. I mean, the money's spent. You can't use that money anyway to pick up anybody else. No, it's, it's an not additional like hit, though. Additional hit for this year. Yeah. I don't know All if right, they so, can afford the hit. I don't know the number off the top of my head. Okay, but it, it's like um, a crazy high hit, I think. It's a crazy high hit, but does that mean is it you're going over the cap for that crazy high hit, or is yeah, it just? I think it might be. Yeah. I All think right, he's so I, literally I need, I need uncuttable. A, so uncuttable because he goes over the cap. Okay, if that's yeah. the case, then I think they're doing the absolute right thing. Then you just you sit him, fuck him. You just, you know, we just have to deal with it this year. We'll, we'll cut him next year. The guy is, you know, if you have talent and you have ability, you are on the field. If, if you, I, I don't want to hear the excuse last year about last week, Kadarius Tony about, you know, we have to, he has to get practice and all that stuff. If you're good and you're good enough and you're trying, you should be on the field. And to me, it's just a clear message that this guy, they've had it. I mean, you see what they've done with, with Logan Ryan. You see what they do with Blake Martinez. They are cleaning house and starting over. And to me, I think they're doing the absolute right thing. And they're cutting, they're cutting bait with cancers. And if they can't cut them from the team, they're cutting them from the field. So I, I give that coaching staff a, a 100% star because, you know, the, the Kenny Sills of the world and, and the, and the James and, you know, they're, they're average. They're if, if they even are average, but they have something that the coaches see that they want them on the field other than a, a prima donna is making a lot of money. So, We'll worry about talent in next year's draft trades down the line. But for right now, it's building a culture. And to that, I give him a star. Wow. I, I got to tell you, I really didn't expect you to say any of that. Um, <laughs> I uh, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I'm, I'm not going to form that opinion yet. Uh, do you, so do you view then – no, hang on. But before I get to that question, though, uh, I don't know if it's yeah. a good thing or a bad thing. But I will say that if they're not going to play Kenny Galladay or Kadarius Tony much, um, then I think that this might be the worst wide receiver group in the league. Uh, so yeah. I'll say I'll say that. Um, but I, I guess to to before i go too much into that like uh do you view Kadarius tony's 28 snaps this week as like an improvement over like as signs of uh renewed yep. faith or some level of trust in him yeah yes oh okay. i think so i, I think, think he was so in... too and i think also there were some plays where he was running a little bit more downfield he felt a little bit less gadgety i know the coaching staff said last week that there was a package of plays for them they didn't get to them because the running game was just working I don't know if I believe that. Um, I probably don't believe that. Um, hey, look, at, at Florida, he didn't play every single snap either. I mean, he was probably our best receiver. Just the way he was used, he was probably, you know, four out of five snaps he was playing. And, you know, so I don't expect him to be on the field for every single snap. He, you know, he's his explosiveness and his things like that, you want to make sure it, it's, you know, for the snaps he's out there, he's at 100 uh, percent effectiveness. And whatever injuries he has might be a factor too. Um, again, if if he had six or seven snaps in this game, I'd be like, "What is going on?" But I, I think you're slowly going to see that rise from the 28 to the, you know, into the 50s 
at some point before this season is over. I, I look at it as very much a positive. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, I think so too. It's just difficult to tell with this coaching staff. Uh, so I've been holding off, but I, I definitely did want to mention it because the story came out today that Kenny Galladay was known. He knew he was going to sit as far back as Wednesday. Uh, Dable said that he was like a professional about it. He knew about it since Wednesday and just kind of went about his, his week or whatever. But um, I don't know. It, it's just that's, that's message uh, sending. And, and maybe what it is, it's it's like sending a message. This is your last shot. Like we've tried everything else with you. How about just sitting and, you know, we're not playing you and see if that motivates the guy. If he comes out and, and practice tomorrow on Tuesday and all of a sudden is not just you know what we believe he is is just not giving maximum effort at all times. You know, become if, if this is a way, the final wake up call for him, then it works out. If he's still just you know, I won't say lazy. I don't know, or just just not deemed by this coaching staff to be one of the five best receivers of one of the worst receiving cores in the league. You know, then I think he just gets exiled at some point. And they just tell him just don't show up. All right. I, I will say, um, contracts aside, you know, we can debate the merits of uh, Kenny Galladay and what he brings, you know, a, a guy like that. You know, I, I think that Kenny Galladay is pretty good. I think he's a deep threat that will win contested catches. It, it just appears that Daniel Jones is not throwing contested catches right now. We can get into that, you know, at another time, whatever. But I, I, I just think that this offense is really designed more for athletes getting into space and then doing things with the ball. It's not really, you know, that traditional, I I don't know, whatever kind of offense where you need this X receiver and the Z and he's got to do this and they all have this very defined role. I think this offense is a lot more about getting athletes regardless of shape or size and, you know, just ability only and just, you know, finding ways to get them the ball and in space. And Kenny Galladay... Maybe he's not being that guy right now. Um, but Kadarius Tony, on the other hand, he is for real. I mean, that is a real weapon. That is a real true athlete. And that dude doesn't even need space. I mean, he makes his own space. Well, don't, uh, don't forget, too, you know, Wanda Robinson didn't play either. So when you put him into the mix. Yeah, but I haven't seen gonna... shit from him yet anyway. So Yeah, but I'm saying, though, I mean, the expectation is until we're proven wrong that it's going to elevate that wide receiver room. We, you know, he said this might be the okay. worst one yeah. in the league. But, you know, the the potential, you know, that we, we took him in the second round for a reason. So the potential of him definitely increases the, 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 the whole overall room itself. I mean, whether he can actually do anything is a separate story, but – He's not playing right now. Yeah, no, no, you're right. I, I, fair, fair point. But let's. Uh, all right. So since we're we've now shifted from coaching decision on playing those guys to the offense, let's just talk about the offense. Um, it wasn't good. Uh, I can say that last week we saw you know a bad first half reversed into a, uh, a much better second half on the on the ground. This game kind of had like two complete drives. And they weren't even really that perfect. And then everything else in between was just kind of either a total mess or was okay until something really bad happened on it and just killed the drive. Um, go ahead, go ahead. Give me your initial I was gonna say. I was going to say my initial thought was, and I told you this at halftime, was my fear was it only takes one week of game film to see stop Saquon Barkley. And at halftime, we had no yards rushing. And – My fear was for, you know, this point for the rest of the season, it's going to be, you know, nine guys in the box at all times and challenging Daniel Jones to make plays. Um, You know, that first drive coming out of the second half, all of a sudden things started to work. So, and again, not consistent enough for, you know, to sustain a lot. I mean, this, you know, we can't play these games every week and expect to win all the time. These kind of slogs, but, you know, it did get better in the second half. Um, it kind of got better in the second half. You know, it was like their first drive after halftime. So to me, that's your adjustment drive. That's almost a scripted. I mean, it probably is at some times. I don't know if this one was, but like a, a scripted drive that's designed to attack. You know, it's it's you you adjusting to everything you saw in the first half and them coming out of the gate and you just keep them on the field. They don't really have time to do anything about it. So I... You know, that seemed to be like the best drive of the game was the adjustment drive right out of halftime. Everything after that was 
back to the same old dredges kind of here and there there were there were some things but i'll say this much right you know your big concern was having a week of game film or just any game film neutralizing uh the great performance that barkley had the week before i understand that but you know there's it's not going to be every week that you're going to have a running game that's going to have 200 yards on the ground with one runner getting 150 all on his own. You know what I mean? Like, that's not going to happen all the time. Right. But what can't happen is the pass protection that Daniel Jones got this week. And this is not, you know, we'll, we'll talk about Jones in a second. Um, but I have to give two farts, um, one to Josh Zudu and the other to Mark Lewinsky, I think. I think he might have had a sneaky bad game here. And he is, mm -hmm. unfortunately for him, he's kind of the only interior guy that's not allowed to have a bad game. Um, you know, he was like the only real free agent we signed this year. So, you know, like John Feliciano, he's super cheap. He's also playing center for the first time in an NFL right. game. Um, Josh Zudu is a project rookie. We already know Ben Bredesen blows. Shane Lemieux is hurt. Right now, Mark I, Lewinsky is the only guy in the interior that's just not allowed to have a bad game, and I thought he got bullied a couple times. Matt Ioannidis walked him right into Matt, uh, Daniel Jones's lap a couple of times. You know, there's just – he's got to be rock steady at least right now until Shane Lemieux is back, and even that, I'm saying that like I have some backup of evidence of Shane Lemieux being some something else, so – um, Josh Zudu, on the other hand, you know, I, I'm he's got legit – He's got a legit uh, excuse in that he's a rookie and he probably should not be in this situation, but he is. Um, and uh, the bigger thing, you know, I get that he got bullied in the passing game. He didn't win as often in the run game, but here's some different things here. A third down false start. That can't happen. He also had an ineligible downfield penalty. That was something that he had issues with in college, I noticed. Just at least two times he had that penalty. They run a lot of screens and whatever. But And that play, that was Daniel Jones scrambling. He's just getting upfield. I have no idea why. Uh, those right. are things that even now, there's no excuse for. He can't do that. You're how, did, uh, <laughs> how, did, how did Evan Neal look uh, pass blocking? Um, up and down. Uh, he had some moments. But, I mean, there were... Brian Burns moves around. That's not a great matchup for him, in my opinion. Yeah, and uh, well, we know that's going to be we know that's going to be a work in process, you know, this year and even next year. So, yeah, uh, I I expect him to have a little bit of uh, issues there. But you know, that's just another reason why Glowinski has to be. He, he's just <clears> not allowed to have a bad game. He's got to be there, next to Evan Neal, helping him out. It just <clears> it sucks, but that was kind of the job he got signed up for. I don't know. That's just my opinion. Um, yeah. Jones, um, some good, some really good throws. I still think he's not seeing the field real well. I think, I think it's time we throw the word gun shy out there. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I think that he is panicking a little bit too much in the pocket. I mean, he has a legitimate reason to. There were bad games from his interior guys, both of them. Um, there's a real threat on the outside that gave Andrew Thomas and Evan Neal all they could handle. You know, they were still winning those reps, but they're washing guys out back there. But there were times it just felt like he was, well, first of all, running the wrong way, running into more pressure. You know, sometimes he was drifting backwards, something you just really can't do. He's not moving up in the pocket and sliding out of it or anything like that. Um, and other times I think just overreacting to the pressure in front of him, um, He's he's a weird guy, and it's like he does a good job of running once he's out of the pocket. It's just his initial engagement of getting ready to run is not very good. Like he's a mess inside the pocket, trying to get avoid pressure. But once he's out of there and he's you know gets a little open space, he's a pretty damn good runner. So it's kind of, it's, it's kind of strange. I just I don't know. So so here's the thing. Um, my working theory at this time is that this is a very new offense. And I think I've seen a couple of times where when everything downfield is covered and he goes through his progressions in this offense, because it's new, I think, that's when he starts to panic uh, a little bit. You can see he's not as comfortable just chilling in the pocket. Then he starts to like look around like he's got to <laughs> scramble. But, but hang on, hang on. 
But also, obviously, whenever there's pressure, he starts to cast his eyes back down. He starts to panic a little bit. I think when both things happen at the same time, he just loses his shit. There could be one guy that's generating pressure, and he's got plenty of room to run. But if he's went through his progressions, and this guy's coming, he just freaks out and whatever. Because there's other times, examples in this game, where he navigates the pocket well, and keeps his eyes downfield, and delivers a great throw. So it's a mixed bag, but something is off he looks way more panicky than than usual and you know something offense agnostic it doesn't matter whose offense it is the guy is now entering his fifth year in the league and okay he hasn't played every game for five years but he's not a rookie you know he's not a first year starter he should be past that by this point you know if we look at other guys that are his peers i don't know if you can say the same thing that these guys are doing the same you know issues that we're dealing with him. I mean, and I, we, we said it last week, this looks like a, a passing offense that's been kind of dumbed down to, to reduce him making mistakes. We're looking at a guy that kind of panics, you know, more often than not in, in the pocket where things aren't going perfectly. It just seems like we're still on training wheels with a guy that he should be past the training wheel standpoint. And I think that's a lot of how this offense is designed. You said before, you know, it's all about getting guys in space and you know quick you know quick passes to get you know, these guys to do their thing. I think a lot of that is not because that's what the offense is. I think that's just the fear of him and what he can do at this point. And I think it's time's running short for him to get over that. Well, and here's what sucks. Okay, um, he's supposed to be in this year proving his job, um, and. You have a coach who sat Kadarius Tony in the first game, just straight up sat him, uh, and now you have just straight up sat Kenny Galladay. Uh, he's not really, and you know, I, I, whatever we can debate the merits of the coach doing that, maybe it's the right call. I don't know. I'm, I'm certainly not saying it's the wrong call, but it doesn't feel like he's still being put in the best position. I mean, whether it's the coach's fault, Kenny Galladay's fault, or, or you know, the universe's fault, he's just still not being put in a great position. He's, he's not well, got his, his top guys out there to help him. Well, now you're getting into conspiracy cranky theory now. All that right. hit me with it. That, they, that they've already made the, him? <laughs> no, no, that they've already made their decision. They're not moving on with him after this year, and there's, you know, they're going to do the best they can this year, but they're they're – thinking about moving on they're thinking about next year it might sound crazy but you know again Kadarius Tony is hardly playing he's probably your best athlete on the field they've made this decision up with uh with Galladay that for you know whatever reason he's not going to play those are your two probably your most gifted athletes of your receivers um I I I I, I just think that this coaching staff has already made their decision, but because they can go with the cover that's their first year, and if losing is not so terrible to get a better pick next year for a quarterback, they're just going to ride with him until the end, and that's it. I I, I don't think it's as crazy as uh, people are going to say immediately, I'm crazy for it. Well, I, I don't even understand what it is you're telling me. You're telling me that they're, <laughs> just, they're just riding Daniel Jones to the end of his contract, and that's it? Yes. That is not at all a crazy theory. I think yeah. that's what most people think is happening. But uh, yeah, I, but, but I think, it, I think but I think it doesn't help them. It doesn't help them to not see what they have in Daniel Jones. Well, I mean, I, 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 that's where you know the. I think the Galladay, the Galladay thing, him not playing again. I think my other theory that they're just cutting bait and they want culture built that's is overriding. I'm, I'm on that's that, overriding yeah. the sabotage. I don't think they're sabotaging Daniel Jones, but I really think in the off season, they made a decision or maybe during, you know, training camp or something, this is not the guy and this is not it. And, you know, but you can't say that, you know, and you can do it under the cover of, we didn't draft him and, you know, we're moving on, blah, 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 blah. So, I don't know. I, 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 I just – I think they're okay with him just playing and just playing it out, and that's it. And whatever the chips may fall this season, if we end up winning – still only winning five games at the end of the day when the season's over, we're in better shape. I think they're thinking about their next quarterback, not him. Well, well whatever. Um, <laughs> I, 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 got, I got nothing to, to say to that. Um, maybe. Do you think – do you think there's any possible way – 
that he can change their mind? Like from what you've seen, even from the first two games this year and how this offense is built around him, do you see any scenario where he's going to, you know, a significant jump in him and in his play that even just a, a, a franchise tag for next year? Because I don't think the play, even, even the, the play of what we've seen from him is like, again, a guy looks like he's on with training wheels. And I think it's too late for a guy with training wheels too expensive for a guy still in training wheels. I haven't seen anything yet. Um, yeah. I also haven't seen him. He's been playing with a. Fu- I'm not making excuses for Daniel Jones, but again, no, I haven't seen anything from him yet. He been, he he didn't have Kadarius Tony in his first fucking game, and you know the second game he didn't have Kenny Galladay. So no, I haven't seen anything yet. I, I think it's a perfectly good theory that they just moved on. They don't really care about what he does or doesn't do. They're worried about bigger things, more long term things like building culture, and if that means sitting guys at the expense of Daniel Jones, a guy they are not interested in, then it makes mm-hmm. sense to just do it. So now I having think that's a having, sound theory. Now having said that. If this team beats Dallas and is three and zero, you know, and then it moves on, and they potentially make up a, you know, a possible playoff run in a pretty bad division, although Philly's starting to scare me a little bit. That means they're not—they're not, they're not going to be like, oh, we don't care anymore. I mean, they're obviously going to, you know, make every effort to win. I don't think that even if this giant team goes on a run, and let's say they win eight games this year, and either they don't make the playoffs or they're really, really close, I think they're going to logically they're probably going to win more games like they have the first two games kind of grinded out gritty games as opposed to Daniel Jones was fantastic and he won the game for them by you know 24 for 31 for 330 and four touchdowns so I I don't think regardless of how this season shakes out whether they win nine games or only win two the rest of the way that the decision is going to be changed about him um I don't know. Uh, I, I think that that could be wrong. Um, and the reason I say that is because this offense is designed to do that. Uh, mm-hmm. So it, it's more likely, in my opinion, it was more likely this year that they were going to lose games scoring more points than it was that they were going to win games scoring less points. I, that sounds stupid, but you know what I mean. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. the, it felt more like they were going to, this offense is designed to get people just, just, to move down the field and we can see the offense when it's clicking it it really moves it moves in chunks you know this is not the jason garrett like uh nine yards at a time um this is a uh a totally different kind of offense this is a chunk play offense this is built for explosive plays and um i could i could see a potential for daniel jones putting up decent numbers uh, and them still only winning like eight games. It's just too early to tell because we haven't seen health. You know, it's it's a new. You know, they're still learning. It, it could it could literally click one week. I don't think it's going to click next week against Dallas, but it could click one week and just roll from there. The answer is probably that he's gone. I certainly think he's gone, but it's dumb to not use this time wisely, in my opinion. Um. I want to flip it to defense, though, because I don't really care. The offense was not yeah. good, in my opinion. So talking about no. it nonstop, whatever. Um, I will mention that DJ did throw a pick again this week that was stupid. It's just that it wasn't caught. Last week, he <laughs> threw a bad one. It was caught. This one should have been caught and wasn't. Anyway, defense. On to defense. Um, uh, I want to give a star, and I could give a star to a lot of guys. I'm going to just start with Wink Martindale. Uh, and the reason why is that this is like a two-parter star. This is carryover from last week. This is two completely different game plans that were just as effective. They were equally as effective. They absolutely positively shut down Derrick Henry last week. And this week they had a completely different animal in Christian McCaffrey. He was the clear number one for this offense. It was very obvious that that's what they were going to do. I mean, it was in the news that they wanted to get him more involved. Um he had you know four catches for 26 yards and i think that's really where they wanted to use him the the 15 rushes for 102 yards is secondary i think they they cared a lot less about what he was going to do taking the ball in the backfield more about what he was going to do downfield and it was almost nothing they also limited robbie anderson three catches for only 32 yards dj moore their their best wide receiver three catches for 43 yards and a touchdown and most of that came 
on the adjustment drive out of halftime. Uh, the Panthers came out of the locker room and they immediately attacked Cordell Flott, who was previously in man coverage on him. You know, rookie, they went right for him. And he wasn't really in bad position either. I would say that Cordell Flott got picked on, but he was not really playing poorly. Overall, Baker Mayfield went 14 of 29 for a putrid 145 yards. Wink Martindale, hats off to you for a fantastic back-to-back performance, getting the most out of a defense that is missing two big stars and now also was missing their starting cornerback on the other side. It is a huge performance for him. Yeah, I mean, no, uh, no Leonard Williams. No, um, you know, your two best pass rushers not in the game. You have to adjust, and they were 2 or 12 on third down. And Baker Mayfield looked incredibly uncomfortable. He looked like he was running for his life half the time, and he was awful. He was, they made him really, really inaccurate. We, we don't think he's that good to begin with. You made the points during the game that this is not the right system for him to begin with. He looked terrible. And... and you know, this uh, this defense is overachieving based on what's on the field right now. And that right, that goes definitely to um, to Wink Martindale. Um, I also had a star for uh, O.J. And Zimenez. I, okay, um, let's hear it. Yeah. It's, a, it's a guy that, you know, we all want to run out of town last year. And none of us thought was going to be on the roster. And again, going back to the culture thing with this coaching staff, you know, I, I think it was Martindale who said, you know, we weren't here last year. We don't know what he did last year. That's irrelevant what it was. We're seeing what the guy did in training camp, how he, you know, worked really hard, picks up this defense, is and is making plays. So again, it's a coaching staff that is just relying on what they're seeing now going forward. They're not worrying about the past. They're not worrying about whether you have a great contract, whether you were you sucked last year or not. So um I give it to Shane Zimenez for, you know keep battling and, and and playing really well he had a sack i think he had you know another hurry or two he was he was good and we, we he said it during the game yeah um i could have given a star to like five or six different people on this defense O'Shane Zimenez was certainly a consideration i have him for a sack a big stop on a screen pass he nearly had a pick at one point and i think he had at least two mm-hmm. pressures it, it seemed like he might have been spying Baker Mayfield at a certain point in the second half. Um, but either way, yeah, he had a huge game. And I probably should have given him a star because I was extra hard on him. I've been extra hard on him. But I instead gave my star to Darnay Holmes. Darnay mm-hmm. Holmes is, is uh, you know, in a system that does not really uh, cater to his strengths very well and he's battling – uh, you know, credit to him. I don't think he was perfect, but he had really good. He had good coverage throughout the game. I thought he was effective as a blitzer in this game. He drew an offensive pass interference in this game. He also had a strip fumble on a tackle, Robbie Anderson, on the first drive of the game on that third down. Um, and he also had a really big play. Uh, he he came knifing in to stop Christian McCaffrey on a screen where there was just green grass in front of him. If he didn't do that, then the tackle's not made from behind. If it was something like an eight yard gain, would have been like like a 36 yard game or something like that. He also had a fantastic pass breakup in the end zone on Shai Smith would have been a touchdown. People don't right. realize that because there was an illegal contact penalty on a Dory Jackson, which was bullshit by the way. Um, <laughs> but because that was an incompletion, they took the penalty instead. But if he didn't make that play, they don't care about the flag on the other side of the field. They'll take the touchdown. So it was a huge play for him that does not go into the stat sheet because of the penalty. I thought Darnay Holmes worked his way to a star from me. But I could have given that to, like, six other people in the defense. I thought Lawrence and and Leo had really big games. Um, Julian Love had a fantastic game as well. Adoree Jackson, too. Obviously, Xavier McKinney. I just went with Darnay Holmes. So, small sample size, only two games. The defense overall is above expectations for you, or is this what you were kind of expecting? This is honestly, <laughs> this is way better than I would have expected um, with, uh, I, I don't know. I, I think it's say, better than. Uh, yeah, okay. All right, so it was a little bit better than I was expecting. You know, it's not like, 
I want to say that I was expecting it to be worse considering that Kayvon and Aziz aren't playing, right? I want to say that. But it's not like they're getting a ton of pressure with the front four guys. When they are getting pressure, it's the secondary guys coming in there. They're really not getting a whole lot with the front four. There were a couple instances. In this game, Leonard Williams had a couple of really nice pressures. Uh, the the Ziminus sack really was a Leonard Williams pressure. <laughs> it's actually hilarious. Baker Mayfield ran right into Ziminus. Um, <laughs> but, you know, they're, they're – the front line is playing kind of how I would have expected them to play without their two starting edge rushers. It's, it hasn't been fantastic. Um, I will say the the defensive backfield is playing better than I expected at this point. Yeah, I'm pleasantly surprised, and they are keeping us in these games. And I think, again, that's all you want is uh, we're going to have to win games with, with the slog. And having a good defense, being able to get stops. Again, like I said, they were 2-12 or 12 on third down. And the only way this defense is going to survive is getting off the field. If you see time possession, if it's you know, 38-22 or something, we're going to be in big trouble. We're not going to be winning these games. So um, just, just a great job by, by Martindale. And, you know, they're implementing their systems. They are, you know, regardless of the talent they have right now, this is the system. This is how they're going to play it. And I think – once you see an increase in talent, you see the guys getting off, you know, uh, you know, Thibodeau coming back and, you know, Ozilari coming back. And then even next year when we, we another round of draft, it's just going to be better and better. So, uh, so far, so good. Yeah. I mean, I already said, I told you that this is, this is my kind of defense. So I'm, I'm all for this. Uh, you know, I was a little worried that this kind of defense would perform really badly without, um, you know, a starting cornerback and, and even that starting corner not being that good, but they've been they've been fantastic in the back. Um, I'm really excited to see what they're going to look like when Aziz and Tibbs are there. Um, I, I, I love this kind of thing. Um, I love this style of defense. It really just brings the heat that dictates the pace of the game. You're not going to just come and like, do what you want. Yeah, the thing about it, which I like, and remember, I had PTSD from having a similar type of defense with Florida where – you know, the backside's always exposed and it was just a complete disaster. Is This seems a lot more organized in what they're trying. It's not just a gangbusters rush. You're not having corners, you know, blitzing in from, you know, 30 yards away with no shot of, of ever getting to the quarterback or something. Um, and again, I think once you get tips back and you get Ojolari back, you may see some more exoticness in what they're trying to do. Um, but I... I like I said, I, I, I think it's been coached really smart. How and it's, it's working. They're squeezing as much, you know, lemonade out of these lemons so far, and that, that's good. Um, I think I guess we can take this opportunity to talk about. Uh, um, you know, you said when Aziz comes back, when Tibbs come back, they're probably going to come back, and Leonard Williams won't be here. Uh, Leonard Williams left this game in the third quarter with a sprained MCL. It's essentially the same injury as Kayvon Thibodeau. Um, so it's not season-ending. It's not devastating. It just needs some rest, uh, a little bit of PT, I think, you know, just to kind of re-strengthen. Um, but I'm going to guess that he's going to be about one week longer than it takes Kayvon, only because he's a vet, and they're going to be a little bit more sure with him and – He's going to be more sure with himself, I think. I think he'll be more vocal about when he's ready and comfortable to come back. But um, So looking four weeks? Yeah, I'm going to guess about four weeks. It's a total guess. I'm not a doctor. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but, but they did sign Jalen Smith to the practice squad today, linebacker that was here last year, formerly with Dallas, longtime Notre Dame, you know, whatever. Um I think that that may be because our linebackers have not been very good. Uh, but also, I wonder if that has to do with being worried about uh, stopping the run with Leonard Williams out for an extended period of time. I mean, especially next week. You know, we won't go into the previews with Dallas, but, you know, with a backup quarterback and Zeke at, at running back, I would be a little bit worried about that, you think? Mm hmm. I definitely think that's a possibility. Um, would you say linebacker has been the biggest worry for you so far on defense this year? No, no, it really hasn't. Uh, corner was. Um, no, no, it, I mean after two weeks. After two weeks? Um, no, it's still corner because I still feel like we haven't 
you know, we played Tennessee and we had A Rob with us, but I also knew that Ryan Tannehill is a guy who can make throws, but he's not going to be great the whole game and he's not really throwing to anybody. Um, and mm-hmm. then, you know, this week I was worried because he didn't even have A Rob, but Baker is in this weird quick throw offense. He looked so uncomfortable. You know, that doesn't even really utilize what Robbie Anderson is best at. You know, I, I still felt like I wasn't facing a real threat. And then, you know, next week, you know, Cooper Rush, you know, I, I just feel like we haven't faced a decent quarterback with good receivers or anything that really is testing anything. So I still mm-hmm. feel most worried about that. Uh, linebackers in this defense tend to be like more of the attacking type. We've gotten gashed a little bit with throws over the middle with some of our disguised coverages linebackers not getting to depth in time Um, but I think some of that is just schematic and maybe just looking at game film and there's probably some adjustment we can do for shit like that Uh, I'm just I'm still worried about the corner spot yeah agreed I have one more star to give out oh and I'm gonna give it to the Giants fans now I don't know if this is because Wink Martindale was talking about it I have no idea if it's just because it was the you know, a warm weather game, but Giants fans were loud. The stadium was packed. There were not. I mean, did we see tons of Panthers fans? Sprinkling. That's just nope. going to be the NFL. Yep, just a sprinkling of, of visiting fans. I mean, this is this is a sad conversation we're having right now. But you know, it even as loud as it got, there were instances where the Giants had the ball and fourth down, the stadium got kind of quiet. I mean, this this fan base is usually too stupid and, and filled with people who don't usually attend and maybe purchase tickets because it was something to do um, because the regular fans don't want to be there for a 38-5 to 5 lashing um, and maybe are, are, <laughs> yep. are talking and, and cheering during a fourth down thing. No, it got quiet in there. There were football fans there. And you know what? They stayed till the end too. Well, it's the perfect storm. You know, it's the first home game. They would won the first game. Perfect weather. You know, it's just that's you're going to get the season ticket holder. It's had the tickets for 100 years, you know, and, and the real fans in the stadium. And uh, they played the part. Um, you know, there's always going to be a handful of, of visiting fans and everyone. That's just the way the NFL is in these days. Uh, but, you know, they did a great job. It, you definitely felt a little energy. But when I again, when I was walking in. I was, you know, I heard the opening kickoff. I can hear the crowd. And then when the fumble happened, I knew something happened here and the way excited that crowd got. But there was definitely an energy that we haven't heard in that stadium in a while. And, you know, we could probably count on one hand all the games in the new stadium that have had energy. So, you know, the best thing, winning cures a lot of things. And the fastest way to you know, to implement that culture we mentioned with the coaching staff, the fastest way to get buy-in from the players so they're not checked out in November, the fastest way for this fan base to not be checked out and selling all their tickets on StubHub and having a half-empty parking lot is to win. So, you know, yeah, we want this team to win. We don't worry. I'm not, again, not worrying about the future. It's until I'm proven, until we're not going to win anything, I want to win. And I think it just makes everybody happy. I mean, you heard the crowd. We were walking out down the uh, the ramp going towards the train. Let's go giant chance. Like, when was the last time we've heard that in a game? We heard cheering. We saw people, strangers hugging. It was great. So it's, that's why we do this. That's why we do this show. That's why we're fans. And that is contagious. So, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the, the Cowboys, you know, on Thursday night, you know, for, for the Friday show. And, you know, it, it's a primetime game. You know, I, I saw when they're doing their previews for next Monday night, they had a big picture of, of Daniel Jones on there. You know, so, you know, coming up this week is, you know, for the game. And it's an opportunity to, if they, you know, win that game in front of their, the whole nation watching, and we know what the ratings are for Cowboy games and, and for a giant Cowboy game, it can do a lot for the psyche of this whole organization and really give some wind in the sails of this team going forward for their, you know, the foreseeable future. That was a perfect segue. We will meet again on Friday morning uh, for our preview matchup against the Dallas Cowboys, a Monday night affair uh, that I am looking forward to attending and uh, I'm a little worried about watching. Um, 
Why is that? But uh, Dallas's defense is scary, and our offense sucks. Um, but it's going to be a good time. And the uh, you know, in the meantime, up until that moment where I have to worry about the game, up until kickoff, we are two and zero. The New York Giants are going to the Super Bowl. They're going to win again. Um, and of course, we will be doing episodes up until then and gloating all the way until then. So, I'm booking my flights for uh, where is it? Phoenix Super Bowl this year? I don't remember. Doesn't matter. <laughs> it I won't prom- be there. I, I I promised that I would be belligerent uh, if we if we started winning. So I'm going to be belligerent on Twitter at football underscore grump, where you can find me there. <laughs> I will be talking shit as long as we're winning every single week. You can follow him at the Cranky Fan, and he also does on YouTube. The FL Teams podcast, where he talks all things Florida Gators, Tampa Bay Rays, etc. Anything special coming up? <sighs> well, if the Rays actually decide to win a game, that'd be nice. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll be talking. Uh, and also, we got a big Florida game with Tennessee this weekend. I think you might hear a little tease for the uh, for the Friday show, a preview of that game, and some quarterbacks to watch. Um, our Lord and Savior Anthony Richardson might not be one of the guys I'm previewing, but. Uh, Definitely check that out because there's some there's some athletes to, to pay attention to for the draft. And as always, this podcast can be found on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, etc., as well as YouTube. So be sure to subscribe there for more of our content. And we will see you all Friday morning. Until then, go Giants. Go Giants.